Right-wing sophist and talking head Dinesh D'Souza has recently appeared on the Young America's Foundation YouTube channel to destroy Marxism with facts and logic. Here in Palo Alto, there's a Ritz-Carlton, there's a Weston. Now imagine a guy who is a valet parking cars at the Ritz-Carlton here in Palo Alto. But I'm less concerned about D'Souza himself because there's nothing special about him. He's just another millionaire mouthpiece paid to push the pro-free market grift. When I see D'Souza, I don't just see him. I also see Ben Shapiro, Steven Crowder, Dennis Prager, Dave Rubin, and Bill O'Reilly, all at the same time. And when I see one of them individually, I see them all collectively, because to, in my eyes they're all the same person, because none of them have ever had an original thought in their lives. Before we get to the meat and potatoes of my response, I'd like to simply comment on how interesting it is that all these right-wing think tanks like the Young America's Foundation and PragerU get so much money from dark money billionaire oligarchs from the Koch brothers to the Wilkes brothers. You'd think the fact that it is literally the powers that be that are funneling money into these think tanks with the deliberate intents to disseminate propaganda on the internet would raise some eyebrows here and there especially when their political opinions tend to mirror that of their dark money billionaire masters. In addition, if all these think tanks do is brassenly lie, obfuscate, strawman, and spout frequently debunked points about Marxism, could it be possible for one moment that maybe, just maybe, that Marxism could very well be their kryptonite, and by extension, working class people realizing their collective material class interest? Anyways, I digress. Without further ado, I shall now review the video titled, But Who Gets the Profit? DeSouza absolutely guts core Marxist arguments. Well, we'll see about that now, won't we? Here in Palo Alto, there's a Ritz-Carlton, there's a Weston. Now imagine a guy who is a valet parking cars at the Ritz-Carlton here in Palo Alto. And this guy is paid, let's say, $15 an hour. And let's say that he works 10 hours a day, so he makes 150 bucks. And this guy is now thinking to myself, in those 10 hours, how many cars did I park? Well, I parked, let's say, 100 cars. And how much does the Ritz-Carlton charge for someone to park their car? $30. So how much did the Ritz-Carlton make as a result of me parking those 100 cars? $3,000. And how much was I paid out of that $3,000? $150. 3,000 minus 150 gives $2,850. Who gets that? Yes, this is exploitation in a nutshell. The capitalist pays not for the labor itself, but for the worker's labor power. The difference being that one's labor power is their ability to do work, and their labor is the work that they have actually accomplished. And by design, one's labor power is always going to be worth less than the labor itself. And so there's a big difference between the revenue generated by the sales and the cost. And that difference Marx calls surplus value. We call it profit. And Marx's this question, quite a profound question, who gets that? I don't know, DeSouza. Why don't you tell us? Now, Marx's assumption is that that belongs 100% to labor. Why? Because labor made the goods. The capitalists supplied nothing more than the money, which has already been recompensed through interest. Yes, and I agree. Workers should own the fruits of their labor. If you actually believe people should get what they work for, and not just sit on their ass and collect passive income, contributing nothing to the value creation process, then you should become a socialist. Consider for a moment the capitalist. In America today, the vast majority of capitalists supply a lot of things, but the one thing they do not supply is capital. Did Steve Jobs actually put up all the capital for Apple? No, he went to a bank. The bank supplied the capital. And we Marxists acknowledge this. Lenin acknowledges this in his book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. In Marx's day, many factory owners and firm owners didn't have to borrow the kind of money that they need to today to grow and expand. However, as a businesses grew larger, the demand to bring future spending to the present grew as well, and over time, there was a merging between industrial capital and banking capital into finance capital, and as a result, firms became subjugated to the banks. All this does is add to the chain of exploitation. It doesn't change the fact that exploitation takes place in the first place. And this is true of Gates and all, everyone down the list. The bottom line of it, the capitalist supplies three things that Marx completely ignores that are actually a far greater value than capital and actually entitle the capitalist to a share of the profit. Here's where de Souza makes his three points, which I will proceed to debunk one by one. First, the capitalist has the idea for the business. Without the idea, there's no business. Labor doesn't think of the idea, the capitalist does. It's his or her idea. They do it. Not always. In fact, most of the time, capitalists are simply taking credit for work other people do. 
Elon Musk has a board of engineers that work under him that do all the real hard work, whom consequentially Musk was busted for abusing said workers. The technology that goes into the modern PC wasn't even conceived by Bill Gates. He stole the intellectual property from a team of engineers and programmers from a firm called Xerox Park. And then there's Ray Kroc, the first CEO of McDonald's. He literally stole the whole business model from the McDonald's brothers and swept the business from under their feet. The truth is that many capitalists don't come up with anything and only get where they are by being the most cutthroat, sociopathic, and profit-driven vampires it is possible for a human being to be. Many of them were either born into extreme affluence in the first place or got extremely lucky. The odds of the average person becoming a billionaire off of their own merit is so unbelievably unlikely that you may as well be buying lottery tickets. And even if they did come up with the idea, they didn't come up with it on their own. Innovation comes from a continuum of knowledge being built upon previous ideas. You don't do calculus without algebra, and you don't do algebra without some basic ar arithmetic. And the idea that anyone should be rewarded disproportionate amounts of money to the point to where it results in tens of thousands of other people being deprived or having their livelihoods impacted in a negative way is patently absurd. Second, the capitalist organizes the business. Here you have this valet, he goes, I parked the cars, I need all the money. The truth of it is, the reason you're, you're getting $30 to park a car is you're at the Ritz-Carlton. Somebody built the Ritz-Carlton, somebody thought of it, somebody paid all the capital costs, somebody bought, took out the insurance. You didn't think of that. If you come to my house and want to park my car, I'll pay you 50 cents. And the slave master organizes his plantation. The king organizes his kingdom. Being a slave master is tough work, and so is being a king. I could use this very same line of reasoning to justify a various assortments of abuses, oppressions, and barbarism that are now thankfully behind us. In addition, there is nothing special about organizing a firm. This is a function that can literally be fulfilled by workers via workplace democracy, sortition, and worker self-management. Worker-owned co-ops do exist, and they have a number of advantages over traditional firms, from better benefits, better work opportunities, lower rate of employee turnover, on-the-job training, and they're much more productive on average. So the reason that you're getting $30 is not because of you. It's not your labor that's worth $30. It's the resort that's worth $30. And you didn't create that. In other words, the labor of others, because it was still workers who built that resort. All of the wealth in society is a product of human labor, and the idea that people shouldn't be paid the true value of their labor because the tools supplied to them weren't built by them specifically is also a patently absurd disposition. So the capitalist has the idea for it, he organizes it, and third, he takes all the risk. And if the business fails, it's generally not the capitalist who suffers for it, it's the workers, because they're all going to get laid off or fired in the wake of that business failing. Once again, there's nothing special about capitalists. They make mistakes, blunders, and fuck up their ventures all of the time. And many times, they still remain rich. Just look at Donald Trump. He has crashed multiple businesses and filed bankruptcy multiple times. And yet, he is still a billionaire, living the maximum standard of living it is possible for a human being to live. Meanwhile, if a poor person fucks up, even once, it will cost them their job which could mean getting them evicted from their home, or going without eating, or missing some bills, leading to a real material diminishment of their livelihood. But who cares? They're just stupid proles, right? Different set of standards for a different group of people, I suppose. Speaking of risk, another advantage to co-ops is that they are more resilient to failure than traditional firms, which means we have even less of a reason to have a capitalist class in the first place. Very important factor. The capitalist gets paid at the end. If the business has a bad quarter, Steve Jobs can't go, or the current, Tim Cook can't go to Apple and say, sorry guys, I'm not going to pay you for six months. It's looking bad for us this half of the year. No, he has to pay them anyway. So labor is trading a fixed wage for security. But the entrepreneur is taking the risk that he might get nothing out of it, and he could even lose money. And guess what? Steve Jobs still remains a multi-billionaire by the end of that quarter. He's not the one who truly suffers for the downturn or the failure of that business. It's his employees that do. 
After all, capitalists spend money to make money, workers spend money to stay alive, and if they can't work, it means they can't make money, which means that they can't spend money. So under free market logic, they can go eat shit and die. So the truth of the matter is that in fairly assessing the just rewards of capitalism, you have to match what the entrepreneur actually contributes. And to say it's just capital, it seems to me, is a gross misunderstanding how business is actually conducted in the United States and all around the world. There is no law of physics or nature or thermodynamics that says we need a capitalist class. We can design a social system with the intent of taking care of everyone. All of the wealth in society is a byproduct of human labor, so it logically concludes that workers are the ones who should bask in that labor. Alternatives do exist, people. We can have a socialist planned economy that works to the benefit of all humanity, or a free market capitalist society that works to the benefit of a shrinking minority at the expense of everybody else. The choice is yours, but just to let you know, the clock is ticking and the planet is slowly dying.